In the last several years, criminologists have really begun to focus on the topic of women in crime. This interest has inspired Amy and I to create a podcast devoted entirely to true stories about women in crime. Twice a month, we will discuss individual stories of women who have been victims of crime or perpetrators. Sometimes these two are one and the same. We will also choose cases in which women have been falsely accused, exonerated, or women whose work in the criminal justice system has brought them notoriety. By staying true to our criminologist roots, we will tell you the full stories of these women, but we will also explain the cause of the events that happened and whether the criminal justice system got it right or not. No matter what, this podcast will focus on women in crime all of the time, so stay tuned. Women in Crime is available now. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. An open and shut case. It's every prosecutor's dream. But what happens when those responsible for moving the very gears of justice forward rely on excuses? Prepare yourselves for one of the most bizarre and unlikely worst case scenarios we've ever covered. This time on Invisible Choir. And I told her not to do this before. She liked to take her hands and put them around your neck or pull your, you know, your shirt, whatever, like that, and, and pull you in, into her face while she yelled at you. I don't know, she met up with some guy. I don't remember his name, but he was Polish. Edward something. Don't remember his last name. But anyway, he, um, he was bad news for her. They were hard to figure out how to open up, but I opened them up just to see if there was anything inside, and inside was this gun. On September 24, 2016, Las Cruces, New Mexico police were called to a local pecan orchard to investigate a call for an abandoned vehicle. The silver 2010 Kia Soul belonged to 67-year-old Nambe resident Elvira Sagura, a retired Santa Fe librarian. Responding officers notified Nambe police of their discovery. The partially hidden vehicle was sitting at the bottom of a steep roadside ravine, carefully parked beneath two overgrown trees, sitting just over 300 miles south of where it was registered. Figuring the car was likely stolen and abandoned, Nambe police attempted to reach out to Elvira Segura, and after three days of no response, they conducted a welfare check at her home. When no one answered the door after repeated knocks, they forcefully entered, eventually finding the badly decomposed body of the retired librarian slain on her bathroom floor, the surrounding walls covered in blood spatter. After canvassing the neighborhood and making contact with Segura's family and friends, they all mentioned that they hadn't seen the woman in approximately three weeks. But they also noted that she had welcomed into her home nearly four years before a 59-year-old drifter named Robert. The man had been fixing up the property in exchange for free room and board. But this mysterious Robert was nowhere to be found. Until nearly three weeks later, when police traced his EBT welfare card back to Las Cruces, where Elvira Segura's car had been carefully hidden. On October 14, 2016, police found Robert Mondrian Powell, who also went by Robert N. Boykin, and brought him down to the state police district office in Las Cruces, where he volunteered to talk to them. An officer escorted the portly man into a small interrogation room, where he sat, a blue baseball cap pulled low over his eyes, chin resting firmly on his arm planted on the table for nearly an hour. But what exactly did he know? And what was he doing buying groceries just a few miles up the road from where the now dead woman's car had been hastily abandoned? Police were about to find out, and Robert Mondrian Paul's recollection of events was just the beginning to one of New Mexico's most bizarre murder cases. Appreciate you coming down and talking to us. Just so you know, it's, I mean, this is voluntary. You're free to leave at any time. Just, um, but I do appreciate you coming down and giving us this time, okay? Okay. Uh, do you know what I want to talk to you about? No. Okay. Um, how long have you, how long did you live with Elvira Segura? Four years and one month almost exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so when did, when did that start? Do you remember? I believe it was the second week of August. 2012. Okay. And uh, how did you come across her? I mean, I knew her for quite a long time. Okay. So how did you, where'd you know her from? When I was the manager of a bookstore, she used to do business with us because she worked for the city library. Okay. So I knew her there and as a customer. Okay. Which bookstore is this? It, well, it's closed now. It was Hastings. Oh, okay. Okay. So when did you first meet her? What'd you say? It had to be around 2001 when I started doing school and municipal accounts. Be right around there. <clears throat> Didn't know her until better socially until about five years later, maybe. Okay, okay. Elvira Segura first met Robert years before while working for the Santa Fe Public Library, 
a career she retired from after 25 loyal years. Segura saw a man who was down on his luck and offered Robert steady housing so he could get back on his feet. Why did you live with her? Uh, did you, I don't know if you had a relationship. I would, no, we didn't have, we were just friends. Okay. But the reason I lived with her was because I was homeless at the time. Okay. And she thought it would be best if I stayed with her, which I did. And I helped out. I did a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff around the house. Okay. <clears throat> and when did you live with her until? About four weeks ago, three weeks, four weeks ago. Four weeks ago. So I about, think, I th yeah, it sounds right. What is today though? Today's October 14th. It might have been a little bit more. It's been more than a month. More than a month. And when was the last time that you actually saw her? It, it was a Tuesday evening, but I can't recall the date. Okay. It's been about a month and a half. It's been more than a month. It's been more than a month. On a Tuesday evening? Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, what what kind of things did you do around the house? You said you did some, you helped her out. <laughs> um, Elvira was retired, and by her own admission, she was quite lazy. So when I first moved in there, there was like 40-some-odd bags of trash in a room. And there was rat feces and stuff like that. The place was a mess. She only had one working toilet, <clears throat> and that was barely working stuff like that. So I said, well, you know, for my room and board and to keep me busy, I'll, you know, start doing stuff. So I did. And put him to work, she did. Robert explained to Las Cruces detectives that Elvira had a persistent knee injury, so he had basically assumed all maintenance and upkeep on the property. He claims that he routinely did all of her yard work, installed new appliances, did needed plumbing to fix her toilets, and even started a garden on her overgrown estate, regularly cooking all meals for the both of them, and even walking her dog twice a day. According to Robert, their arrangement was mutually beneficial. Elvira was finally getting the vital help she needed to maintain her home, which had fallen into semi-disrepair over the years, and Robert finally had a steady place to call home. But Robert was also a talker, and with little probing from detectives, he began shedding light on the other people Elvira Segura led into her life, others he viewed as problematic, as if to preemptively eliminate any suspicions the police might have regarding him. After all, they hadn't even explained why they brought him in for questioning in the first place, yet there he was. You really fixed up her house, huh? Yeah, well, it wasn't exactly falling apart, but I mean, she, it just wasn't working for her. <clears throat> she'd, I, she'd had a rough time. She'd had a rough time for a long time. And then after she retired, she, um, I don't know, she met up with some guy. I don't remember his name. He was Polish. Edward something, I think. Don't remember his last name. Was nothing but consonants. But anyway, he, um, <clears throat> he was bad news for her, I guess, and strange. And then she was drinking a lot at one time, and she absolutely could not drink. If she was started drinking, she would just get absolutely enraged at anything. The drop of a hat, she was very touchy about things. And I guess she had problems with her neighbors. They took out a restraining order against her. <clears throat> I don't know how long that lasted or anything. I think it was still in effect when I moved in there, I'm pretty sure. Mm. But I don't know, I don't recall. But So she was just like livid with her neighbors for doing that to her. She just was kind of hard to get along with them. And she, if, Carl was making too much noise across the way. She'd get up and run over there and I'd try to stop her. But she would get up and run over there and start yelling at him for making so much noise. And anyway, this guy caused trouble and finally he had to split because it was just too much hassle. And then Carl called the environmental department or code violations or whatever it was because her um, septic system was malfunctioning. And um, I told her, I said, well, I know how to put it in. But I said, I can't do all that digging by myself. So she called somebody finally, but they, um, she ignored it. Now I know she got the warrant or, or the, what do you call it? Not the warrant, but the, whatever it is where you have to appear in court. I know she got it, but she said she didn't. And then so they called up somebody to come and pick her up. She had to spend the night in jail and she didn't like that much either. And so she finally, real quick, because I told her, I said, you got like 90 days to get this done or you're going to be in trouble. So it was real quick, she, she called somebody and they came out and put out the, the, they dug the line, or the, they dug the hole, and I got the stuff, you know, the, the material to do it with, and I put most of it in. They did the connection, but I did most of that myself, too. It wasn't hard, but I, I didn't have the equipment to dig the hole and stuff. So, but yeah, she she'd had some problems with some people. She didn't really talk to too many people, really, and she got kind of bad where she would um, have problems talking on the phone 
like if she needed to call in a prescription or something, I usually had to call a prescription in for her. I used to work for a company that was a pharmaceutical company, so I knew how to do it. I'd call in her prescriptions for her because she'd get all, I don't know, just kind of freaked out sometimes on the telephone. And she just didn't really have any close friends. Every once in a while, somebody would call. Without ever once addressing the elephant in the room that Alvira Segura's dead body had already been found, Robert Mondrian Powell begins spinning a tale for detectives of a woman he claims was an angry drunk who abused her prescription medications, a woman who aggressively confronted her neighbors at the drop of a hat, a reclusive woman with few friends and many enemies. Robert Mondrian Powell was engaging in what experienced law enforcement interrogators refer to as listing or offering up as many plausible explanations or scenarios in anticipation of an eventual confrontation. If not him, then who? You said she didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I knew it. I, the entire time I lived there, let me think. There was one guy, he was a Native American that she knew, that had stayed with her at one time. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, I just met him the one time. And he stopped by to see her, but he hadn't seen her in like more than two years at least. And, um, yeah, she, and then, well, that's what, there was a neighborhood guy, but he wasn't really a friend, he was just a strange guy that used to come around once in a great while. Hmm. And, bum a cigarette or something and then move on. But this one guy is the only one. And then, and then I, well, I did see Edward once too. Edward came there once. He wasn't, I don't think he was supposed to be there, but he showed up one night, I remember, for like a day. And he went, he showed up the day before her court date to figure out her septic system. And um, he went to court I took her there, and we went to court, and he went to court. After they got out of court, after we got out of court and stuff, and um, they they got into it. So I had no idea what it was about. I just, it was just, like, explosive, screaming and yelling, and blah, blah, it was really bad. So he jumped out of the car and just left, and that's the last I've seen of him. But he did show up that one time. I don't think he was supposed to be there, but he did. Less than 20 minutes into his questioning, Robert Mondrian Powell had already listed as many as four other possible suspects, but police hadn't even yet revealed that his former housemate had been found dead. And before they continued with their questioning, they noticed something on one of Robert's hands, a freshly healed cut still red around the edges. But why was Robert spending so much time introducing a lengthy list of people who had problems with Elvira? What exactly did he have to hide himself? The healing cut on his hand would soon provide detectives with their answer. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or that is preventing you from achieving your goals? I've been there myself. In 2006, I was the victim of a violent assault, and it's part of what brought me to true crime podcasting in the first place. And though I almost lost an eye in the attack, the psychological impacts of what happened persisted for years until I found someone to talk to. BetterHelp is not a crisis line or self-help service. It's professional counseling done securely online. The service is available for clients worldwide and offers a broad range of expertise which might not otherwise be available in your area. BetterHelp will assess your individual needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And the best part, you can start communicating in under 24 hours. Once connected, you can log into your account anytime via phone, tablet, or computer and send a message directly to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you'll never have to sit in that uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp is committed to establishing a great therapeutic match, so they make it easy and free to change counselors as needed. It's also more affordable than traditional therapy, and financial support is available to those in need. Let BetterHelp assist you in living a happier life today. Our listeners can get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com forward slash invisible choir. That's betterhelp.com forward slash invisible choir. Or click the link in the show notes to join the over 800,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional today. What would you consider you to Elvira? A good, I was a good friend of hers. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that she was mean? She was very mean. She was abusive. She abusive towards you? What is that? It's scar? a scar from the last time that she hit me with a folding table. Okay. <clears throat> when was that? Just before I left. And what uh, started that situation? I have no idea. She would, you'd be reading or watching TV or sleeping. She seemed to come at you when you'd be sleeping. <laughs> Did you have to defend yourself against her at that point? Well, it would, she would just start going off. I, I do remember now what, why I got this was because her, her headphones on her computer stopped working and she'd listen to audiobooks constantly. And she would sew and listen to audiobooks. And 
I said, well, let me check your headset. So I checked her headset. There was nothing wrong with the headset. It worked on other devices. And I fiddled with it, and I thought, and I thought well, the connection on the, on the computer is shot, maybe. But then it would go in and out, and in and out, and I was like, so I said, well, I said, let me look up something. So I had a tablet, a little, you know, tablet computer. So I went and looked up troubleshooting on her model and why it would or would not possibly work. And in the meantime, she said, well, I guess I'm going to have to buy a new computer. And I said, well, that's just silly to buy a new computer when this is a very minor problem that could probably the Geek Squad could fix for you. I said, I, I don't know why you'd want to spend that much money on a brand new computer unless you really wanted one. I said, that's, that's just plain silly. Let me, let me look this up. And I did. I looked it up. And evidently, you can change what's called a driver on a computer. I'm not a computer nerd, but I understood what they were talking about. So I changed the driver to headset, which wasn't that difficult. And then put it in, it worked fine. And nothing was, there was no problem, really. You know, I didn't sense any kind of a problem. <laughs> and that afternoon, after I got through watering the garden, I was laying in bed, and I was, like, half asleep. And I, I, I believe I had the headphones and was listening to a political show. And I hear, I hear a, just a screeching noise, and I thought, what in the world? But I didn't pay too much attention because it was intermittent, you know. Kept coming and going, I thought, what? And so I sat up, and when I sat up, she came storming into the room. And, um... She said something about, I can buy my own computer if I want to. And she was just yelling at the top of her lungs. And I said, well, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say you couldn't afford a computer or something. I said, that's really your business, but I'm, just, I'm sorry I made that comment. And then she, she went on and on. And she, she, kept, she had this bad habit of like not sticking to one thing. It was pretty erratic. You know what I mean? It would be from this side to this side. to, the, And then, you know, and I, it, it was hard to make sense of it. So I would just sit there kind of like most of the time dumbfounded. And then she'd start name calling. Then she'd get in your face. She liked to poke you with her finger, too, and uh, she looked, she was pretty nasty that time. And then, so to tease her, I took the the what do you call it the tablet and I put it on video. I thought, well, maybe she'll calm down. And I was filming her in her rage, and she did not like that at all. I meant it as a joke. It was evidently she didn't like it, and um, she got really. And then so she went, she left, and I thought, well, good, that's over because she calmed down and there was no problem. Robert then began explaining other previous altercations that he had had with Elvira, incidents in which he claimed she would become confrontational and at times violent with him, but that they usually came on sporadically when he was in a vulnerable position laying down or sleeping. This time was no different. Robert claims that after their initial argument subsided, he went about his chores out in the yard for the rest of the afternoon before coming back inside to eat dinner and enjoy a short nap. After he had laid down and finally fallen asleep, that's when he claimed Elvira Segura came back in one of her, quote, rages and attacked him. I felt this poking on my back and sometimes the dog would come and poke you with his nose, with her nose, and I thought it was her, but it was her, and she goes, she starts, she said right away, oh, did I startle you? And she was like really, you know, sarcastic, and all this, oh God, she started going on and on about this, that, and the other, and it's just, I, I don't remember, to be honest with you, what all the raving was about, but it was all over the place. And then, and then so, I was, I went to turn around to put the, what do you call it, the laptop, the, the tablet, it has a little case thing, and I went to put it down, and I pushed it aside, to the side of the bed and uh, she grabbed it and she had a habit of destroying her own property too which is she did it with them um, well no the second one wasn't her fault but the first one was she um if i was watching tv and especially if i had because I, I had these wireless headphones if i was watching tv she would yank the tv with the wires and everything away and she yanked it so hard that she it fell down on this on the top of the console that it was on and uh it cracked the screen just all to hell and I was like, why are you destroying your own property? I just was like, I couldn't believe it. She did that. Well, she took the tablet this time and then threw it across the room and just shattered it. One whole side was totally shattered. This, and I was like, oh, great. According to Robert, he was simply a victim of circumstance. Living in Alveda's home, he claims that she often took her aggression out on him for no reason at all. And this time, she took it too far. And as the two detectives now in the room with him begin questioning him more directly, Robert exhibits extreme caution, careful not to refer to Alveda in the past tense while speaking about her character. And I told her not to do this before. She liked to take her hands and put them around your neck or pull your, you know, your shirt, or whatever, like that, and, and pull you in, into her face while she yelled at you. And I told her, don't do that, please. I, I said, you don't have the right to do that. That's not right. And I screamed at her once about it. I mean, I screamed at her, yelled at her, don't do that. And it didn't seem to have any effect. And this time she started it again. And, she, and I turned around and I rolled up kind of like on my side. And I was just like trying to ignore her while she was going on and on. The next thing I know, I hear the... the there was a little, like a TV tray, you know, a wooden TV folding tray there with a 
fan on it, and the fan went crashing to the ground. And I didn't see her do it, but I know, certainly I felt it. And I turn around, and there it comes crashing down on me. Oh, hit, hit my arm and my head, like right there on the top, and then hit my arm. And, and I was, oh, and she, boy, she whacked me good, too. <laughs> she whacked me good. It splintered, splintered the table. And then she grabbed um, the TV remote, which was a great, kind of a big affair, a big thing like that that lights up. And she threw that in the same direction that she, which was towards the bathroom, that she threw the tablet. And, uh, but it bounced off of an easy chair that was there, and I don't think it hurt it. Well, and um, so that was that event. How did you defend yourself against that? I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to hit her or nothing like that. I had that once. Um, once I pushed her because she was right on top of me. I didn't push her like this, but I had my knee up. And she went into my knee and I extended my knee. And she, she went backwards into the couch. But then she seemed to get like more excited. It was like she wanted to incite you to do something. And she would just get worse when you did something like that. It was just like, ah, it was just getting... It's just, it, was, it was like night and day because the thing about it is a very a generous person, you know? She's a generous person. No, you know, no, she, no. She's, she's real generous and, and you know, and, and but it's like this like yin and yang thing. I don't know how to describe it. Robert continues framing himself as the perpetual victim, continually reflecting upon other aggressive altercations that he had over the years with Elvira. But detectives wanted to know what happened the night he cut his hand what ultimately drove him to abruptly leave her home after the two had shared the estate together for nearly four years. They also wanted to know why Robert hosted a yard sale around the time he allegedly left, selling off various valuable objects belonging to Elvira, and why, during the sale, the neighbors who mentioned it said she was nowhere to be found. So, right before you left, there was you had a yard sale? Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, she had um, some stuff that she, she wanted to get rid of, and she had kept ordering these... Um, Things, we needed some of them, and I'd used them, and I was glad to get them. But she wanted a cordless drill, so she ordered a Makita, but it wasn't cordless. She didn't pay attention when she ordered things. I, a lot of times I'd say, Albert, let me look at it first if you don't mind. So that we don't. And she hated to send it back because it was a pain in the butt. So she and this, it wasn't what she wanted. So and uh, so what, what, I put the, I put that in there, and I put a saw, a circular saw in there that was not never used ever. Brand new? Brand new. She had one before. She loaned it to somebody. And that was, and um, after she ordered it, the guy came back and gave it, to, returned it, and it was like, it had like a one inch diameter bigger than this one, so this one was never used. And the other one was, I mean, it was a wonderful sauce, so I sold that and that, and I sold some knickknacks, a few knickknacks, and uh, stuff like that, and a couple of baskets, I think, and just a little bit, not very much stuff, not very much stuff. Where was Elvira during the uh, yard sale? She was at home. Was she inside? Yeah. What was she doing? She, sewing. Sewing? Yeah, we talked to some of the neighbors and they said that they didn't see her at the time. Well, yeah, she was there. I spoke to her on the porch, as a matter of fact. At one point, I had to ask her a question about, about um, uh, uh, a tray, a folding tray. Now, did any of the neighbors see her that you're aware of? I don't know. I mean, I was there, but I don't... You sold some of the tools to some of your of the neighbors? Some, yeah, some guy. I think he lives next door. I don't know what his name is. So. Over at Peñas. Oh, okay. The one has a gallery or something? I, yeah. Okay. She didn't help out with the yard sale at all? She chose some items. What do you mean she chose? She them? chose some items to, to go for sale. Oh, okay. Because okay. she had had all these, like, tons of baskets. And then she bought a thing on Amazon again and then put it together. And it was a shelving unit that f rolled and had a bunch of baskets in it. She got she, she got that straightened out the way she wanted to. So she had a multitude of these baskets. They were, like, taking up so much room. I was hanging them from the ceiling. There were so many. Sensing cracks in his ever-evolving stories, the detectives redirect Robert back to the final fight he had with Elvira, the night he allegedly cut his hand and left. On a hunch, they wanted to know what happened after Elvira allegedly threw the TV tray at him, and how he responded, because up until now, he so clearly did not want to talk about what happened afterwards. And so before you came here, you were talking about this scar. Is that right before you left? I'm sorry? This, the scar that you got on your hand, yeah. that fight that you, that you guys had? Yeah. Was that right before you left to us from yes. Santa Fe or not yes. Can we talk a little more about that? Sure. Um, so she, you said she swung and hit you with the, uh, the table, mm -hmm. correct, with the little, where you eat? Yeah. And what happened after that? Um, we got in, uh, we had words right after she hit me with that, on that particular, on that, the last time. And, um, uh, and I, 
told something, I said something to her. I said, you know, that's like assault and battery over here. I said, I don't want you to go to jail. And I said, because I don't know who's going to run your house. And um, so she had, she had sat down on the couch, the little, what do you call it, bed thing across from me. She had sat down there, and then she just started calling me every name of the book and stuff like that. And so then I started to get up, and I went to pick up a plate that needed to go to the kitchen. And I went to pick up the plate, and then she started in again and uh, started uh, hitting me with her fists. And then she blocked the way. She ran in front of me to the door, to the bedroom door, blocked the way, and then um, started taking swings at me, which she was not very good at doing. And uh, so I got enraged, and I, I pushed her back towards the center of the room to get her out of the way. I, I don't know if I, I grabbed her like this and moved her, and I said, Elvira, get out of the way. And I moved her, and at one point she went down on the floor, and we got into it, and I hit her. Uh, I hit her head, or she hit her arm when she fell, and it did not sound good. It sounded like it hurt her. And also, um, I went to tell her, get up, over here, just get up. You need to leave the room. And she, she was having trouble getting up in the stand there, but she was just still cursing me and cursing me. And I lost it, and I, I started, and I pushed her back down onto the floor, and I hit her head several times, I know, on the floor, which was a brick floor. Suddenly, after nearly 40 minutes of evading questions, Robert Mondry and Powell went into a full-blown confession. He had finally had enough and admitted that he snapped. Do you try to stop her from talking at any time? Do you put her hand, your hand over her mouth? Or, uh, no, I didn't put do her, your hands on her neck? I, no, I didn't do that. No, but I did. I did hit her. Okay. What happened after that? And then um, I was just so angry. I was absolutely angry, angry. And um, I said, you need to go. I said, you're bleeding over here. You need to go to the, um, your bathroom and you need to uh, clean up. And she seemed a little bit stunned, but she was still just, I mean, still just really just absolutely livid and <laughs> screaming and yelling at me and everything else. And um, so I told her, I, I said, now, now I've done it. I said, I, I'm going to go to jail because you made me lose my temper. And I said something like, I really don't want to go to jail or something like this. It's just ridiculous. And I was, I was mad, but measured. I wasn't screaming or yelling or anything like that. But, um, so, but she wouldn't give up on it. She wouldn't stop. How did you get her to stop? I, she followed me into the bedroom, and I went and I reached in under uh, the cushion in the, what do you call it, the folding bed, the day bed, the futon bed. And um, I pulled out a gun, and when she went back to her bathroom... I pointed it at her, and I told her, you need to really relax and calm down. I said, this is enough, this is over. And I kind of lost my, I don't really remember. I remember saying, this is enough, it's over. I don't remember. And I was talking at her, but I can't remember everything I said, to be honest with you. And um, so at one point, she reached down and got it. She had thrown a bunch of stuff like that was on a folding tray, no, not a folding tray, just a wire shelf. She uh, kicked it threw it all over the place and went into the bedroom and everything. And um, she grabbed a, what do you call it, a, some sort of a mat. I do remember that. A shower mat or something. And um, she bent down to pick it up or something, and she went down on one knee. And when she went down on one knee, I pulled the trigger and shot her. Where'd you shoot her? In the bathroom. Do you know where it hit her? No. I did see blood coming out from around her, her neck or back of her neck or something. And I pulled the door closed and I never opened it again. Robert claimed to police that he found the long silver revolver that he used to shoot Elvira Segura months before when he was cleaning out boxes from a storage area in her home. He opened a mysterious locked silver case and found the loaded gun inside. He claims that he hid the gun for, quote, safekeeping underneath a couch cushion inside the home, where it remained tucked away and loaded until he retrieved it that September evening, killing the very woman who gave him shelter from the harsh New Mexico desert. Uh, how long were you there after that happened? Day. day and a half. One day and a half. What did you do with the gun? Um, I put it on the bed in our bedroom. I didn't want to look at it. I was absolutely shocked. And you left it there? No. I 
when I came to Santa Fe, I brought it with me. My intention was eventually to use it on myself. Where is it now? It's in some trees near, near the Masonic Cemetery. I think it's still there. I haven't looked at it in days. Was it hidden pretty well? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you mind taking us out there to show us? I'll take you. So then you, uh, once this happens, you're there for about a day and a half or so, then what, what are you thinking at this point? I was thinking that I was going to try and come to Santa Fe and, no, not Santa Fe, um, Las Cruces, and I decided, well, I'll just take the gun, and, but I didn't want to do it there. So, okay. with what little bit of money I did have, I, I had enough for, like, a tank of gas, and I have something like that. I came to Las Cruces. I just drove straight down. And I was going to, twice I came really close to pulling the trigger, but I didn't. Albina Segura's body was in such an advanced state of decomposition when police finally discovered it that the medical examiner listed her cause of death as uncertain, though she was missing key vertebrae in her neck, an injury consistent with a gunshot wound to the area, as Robert had described. But a bullet was never recovered from the scene or Alvita's body, and the autopsy report listed two other critical nonviolent possible causes of death, including cardiac arrest and fatal ingestion of rubbing alcohol and amphetamine. Robert Mondrian Powell then admitted to taking Alvita's car, effectively closing the loop on the entire investigation. What'd you do with her car? It's in a pecan grove off of uh, Old Highway 28. Why'd you leave it there? It ran out of gas and the battery was not good, so couldn't do anything with it. Where did you go after that? Into town, and I've been hanging out ever since. Okay. Where have you been staying? Here and there, just wherever I could, been staying outside. Outside mostly? Always. Always. There's no shelters or anything to assistance? I, I don't know. I didn't check. Okay. Do you have any questions? Re recently I've come down with what I think is COPD, so I can't really walk that far without getting really tired and breathless and stuff, so it's amazing I was able to make it into town. So the uh, cemetery where you say the gun is hidden, is that here in Las Cruces or Santa Fe? It's here in Las Cruces. In Las Cruces, are you still willing to take us out there? Yes, I will. Thank you. I don't want to make it. What's that? I don't want to make it hard on anybody, really. So um, might as well just. You didn't remove anything from the gun after you fired it? I pushed that little cap out, whatever that little brass part is that's left. I, I pushed it out at one point. And where did that go, do you know? I have no idea. Do you, I honestly can't remember. I would tell you if I knew, but I can't. It must It must have been a, at least... Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. I don't remember a lot after um, the first day. I think when I wrapped it up in, the, in a bag, I, that's when I pushed that little part out. But I don't... I don't know where the part would be, I'm sorry. Well, would you be willing to take us out there now? Yes, sir, I will but take you there. Thank you. Robert Mondrian Powell was arrested on site and then took police to the small cemetery where he hid the murder weapon. It was carefully wrapped in one of Elvira Segura's red floral purses and tucked into the thick low branches of a tree. Police believe Elvira was already gone when Robert hosted the yard sale at her home, her dead body likely already there on the bathroom floor where it remained undiscovered for nearly four weeks. The case was moved to district court and the charge eventually reduced to second degree murder. In the beginning, it seemed this was shaping up to be a textbook open and shut case. After all, police had a body, a murder weapon, and a detailed confession. Robert Mondrian Powell's fate for all practical intents and purposes had been sealed. But in a stunning turn of events, Robert Mondrian Powell would never face trial for taking Alvira Segura's life. His case was initiated by assistant DA Natalie Perry in October of 2016. But over the next 20 months, Mondrian Powell would attend an incredible 25 related pretrial hearings as an astounding eight separate attorneys from the DA's office were assigned his case, one after the other, due to high turnover in their office. In one of the most bizarre and negligent prosecutions ever attempted in New Mexico state history, one violation after another riddled the prosecution's lackadaisical efforts to bring justice to Elvira Segura's killer. One of the assigned prosecutors, when confronted by the judge, admitted to never prepping for the case at all or reviewing previously recorded pretrial hearings because he, quote, didn't have the time. After failing to arraign Mondrian Powell in a timely manner, failing to produce expert witnesses to testify from the Office of the Medical Investigator, and failing to produce evidentiary discovery to the defense in a timely manner, District Judge T. Glenn Ellington dismissed all charges against confessed killer Robert Mondrian Powell on the grounds that his constitutional Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial had been violated. 
and that he had been, quote, oppressively prejudiced, suffering both physical and sexual assault while incarcerated and losing over 72 pounds due to unresolved health issues that were left untreated while he awaited trial at the county jail. In June of 2018, Robert Mondrian Powell was released a free man. All charges had been dropped. In one final demonstration of the bloated bureaucracy of New Mexico's failing justice system, Robert Modrian Powell's public defender was attending an appellate court hearing on his behalf regarding the conditions of his release in 2019 when she found out that he had died 10 months earlier, in October of 2018. The cause? Hypothermia due to cold environmental exposure. He died while sitting upright in a chair outside of a nonprofit organization that provided services to the homeless. Thank you.